we have put out. Um, so the original nature, the Nature Conservancy's original biocontrol guidance that was put out was one of the first things that we did back in 2012. Um, this was to help states address the rising uh, request that we were getting for the way that we can re that we can release biocontrols on our own property. Uh, we're in the process of reviewing that document and figuring out if it needs to be updated or if that's no longer something that we're using as an internal guidance document. Uh, next is our guidance on herbicide use. This is another internal document that we created back in 2016-ish era, and it was looking at the way that the Nature Conservancy utilizes herbicides on our properties for the purpose of invasive species management. We get a lot of questions about that, why we use them, how we use them, and this is really a great document um, that we have internally that we can share uh, with practitioners and people asking these questions. Again, this is another document that the that the committee is in the process of reviewing and updating to make sure that it has the best information out there. Um, the next thing on the list is managing for resilience. I am not saying that we're taking credit for this. This was a wonderful document and guidance that was put out at the North America level by Mark Anderson and his team. But the original idea for this was born out of conversations within the Invasive Species Advisory Committee and the greater invasive species community within the Nature Conservancy, and this desire to figure out a way that we can look forward and managing manage our lands in the face of a changing climate. Um, probably in the last two years, I don't exactly remember this next one came out. Um, we published a document on the correlation between insects and disease of forest pests and pathogens with reduced carbon sequestration in uh, forests of the contiguous United States. So this is a good document. It's a good way to reference the way that um, forest pests and pathogens may be impacting work uh, that we're trying to do. And again, impacting those 2030 goals that we have for the organization. Um, about three years ago, and again, the time just sort of all slides by, so I could be very wrong with my time frame. Uh, we started an internal and external communication strategy. This webinar right now is a direct result of this internal communication strategy update, looking at the way that we can provide the best, most up-to-date information for practitioners, both inside the Nature Conservancy, outside the Nature Conservancy, in a timely fashion, in a way that people will actually use it. So there's a couple other things within that strategy, but this is the one that we are uh, using most readily right now. And then finally, it says new, re new re newly released. Um, it's sitting in my inbox to share with my coworkers at the Nature Conservancy. We have just uh, published a doc, uh, published another white paper on restoration and the impacts that invasive species can have on pre, during, and post restoration processes. And that was authored by um, quite a few members of our invasive species advisory committee. If you are looking for continuing education credits, and Megan, I think you have more information on this. You want to come on yeah. mute? Yep, definitely. Thank you. So yep. we did receive uh, the following continuing education credits that you see listed on the screen and to have them awarded to you, you must stay for the entire webinar and participate in a poll that will be given at the end. And that's all I have for that. Thank you. Great. That's awesome. I think this is one of our first times offering continuing education credits as part of this webinar. So again, we're trying to bring you guys the best, most useful information that we can and provide you with the educational credits that you need to keep those licenses credit current. Um, and finally, if you wanna connect with us, um, you're more than welcome to reach out to any member, um, any active member of ISAC. Um, there's a list of us there in the states that we sit in or the regions that we serve. Um, you can connect with us on uh, the Nature, if you are a Nature Conservancy employee on our internal connect, um, service. I know everyone hates hearing. You can find it on Connect, but you can find us on Connect. Um, you can email our um, our listserv. If, again, if you are a TNC employee, you can email us through that. Um, it's a great way to get the conversation going. If you have a question that you would like to have answered by people, there's over 200 people on that email list, so it does reach a lot of people and you can get good questions answered. And then finally, I put my email down there at the bottom. You're always more than welcome to reach out to me directly and I can get you to somebody who can help you. I do request that you make sure you put that dash Marie in the middle of my name because if you email just Cody.Miller, it will go to a wonderful preserve manager in Nebraska who hates getting my emails. So um, hopefully I look forward to hearing from some of you at some point with your questions and don't ever be shy to reach out.
So with that, we are going to switch over and for what we're actually here for. And Dr. Blasi is going to talk to us about the biocontrol process. And let me give a little background on who he is. And if I do it, don't do it justice, you are welcome to uh, correct me when you when I turn it over to you. So in 1992, Dr. Blasi moved from northern Germany to New York at Cornell University, where he is a professor directing the ecological and management of invasive plant programs. He also is the principal investigator for New York's Invasive Species Research Institute. A major part of Dr. Blasi's work is the development and implementation of biological control, control programs utilizing insect herbivory. Among his target plants are purple loosestrife, garlic mustard, water chestnut, Japanese knotweed, and invasive Phragmites. The ultimate aim of the work is to increase the conservation value of all lands through the development of best management practices. And I thank you so much for joining us today, and I will stop sharing, and the screen is all yours. Thank you, Cody Murray and uh, Rob, for inviting me. So I will see what uh, you have not enabled screen sharing as of yet, so I can't do it. Megan, that would be you. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to see. Rob, um, since you're the host again, click the ellipsis on Burns screen. Yep. I think it works now. Okay, perfect. Let's see. This should be the one. Do you see my uh, screen? Yeah. You need to hit the slideshow um, option at the top, I believe, to get it to go into slideshow format. There we go. OK, it's, it may be a slightly delayed. I'm on a DSL line. So if there's an occasional interruption, I apologize for that. But you should just see the screen, not the reason for control side screen. Is that is that correct? That's what I see. Okay. Per perfect. So once again, thank you for having me here. I'm trying to do a little whirlwind through this and give you the example that I have uh, worked at for the longest time, loose drive, um, because it's maybe a showcase of how it should be done. I just say that proudly, and uh, you can correct me if, I, if I'm wrong about that. Um, and so there's lots of things that I can't touch on uh, that I'm prepared to discuss if there are questions about it. My title is slightly different than what you have, but the information that I'm going to be presenting is about is about the same. So let me just go through this um, and uh, see where we're at. If my slides are actually advancing, let's see what uh, is happening here. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so. Uh, there's a little delay here. I'm not quite sure. So typically, we are probably here from the interest that we have about the ecological impacts of introduced species. So reduced biodiversity, species endangerment, other things. But there are other reasons why um, people try to control introduced plants. Um, that That's for sure. And some of them are listed here. I'm not going into details, but uh, here are a couple of examples of species that I work with. You may want to remember this top slide with all the loose strife in it. Um, and then typically managers throw the uh, uh, toolkit at the species that we have. And this is about all that I could think about from mechanical harvesting to cutting to spraying, disking to fire and uh, spraying options. And the typical things that come to mind is always to worry, what are we doing? Um, are we making things better? I don't know whether people always worry about that. I do worry about it because just by being introduced is not necessarily um, uh, the verdict has to be guilty for it. And we may be talking about that for a moment. But for me, the only uh, specific um, control option is really biological control. 
because everything else that you have seen before will wipe out everything, even hand weeding or hand pulling as side effects because you need to step somewhere, right? So whatever you step on uh, may recover or may not recover, or you may make a mistake in what uh, you pull up. Um, and there's soil disturbance and all kinds of other things and with it. But biological control with host specific uh, insects, that's what I work with, um, is extremely specific. And here's an example of purple loosestrife where the brown things are loosestrife, defoliated by um, leaf beetle larvae or the small insect where an entire population here at Montezuma in the wildlife refuge in Northern New York or in central New York, but north of where I'm sitting has been cleared and you have clear water at a time where everything should be green. That's kind of late June, early July. So the question though is, are there ecological benefits or are there risks associated with um, biological control? And when I'm using the word biological control, here's the definition that I use. And I use the word classical biological control um, because you could also use biological control using native organisms. Um, and sometimes people have tried that. Sometimes it works. Very rarely does it work. Um, but I would also argue that most of the introduced plant species are under some form of biological control or biotic resistance because they're not invasive. Um, we can talk about that as well. But here's the definition for what I'm talking about today. It's the introduction of host specific natural enemies, mostly insects, very occasionally um, 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 diseases or fungi or something like that from the native range of the target non-indigenous plant. So that's what we're talking about today. I'm going to give you an overview of how a weed biocontrol program should be run. I have to admit that none of the programs that I, um, I know, have thought and read about will come up to snuff with all of the uh, things that I lay, uh, lay out here, because there's always some missing things. Funding is missing. Expertise is missing. Um, and uh, But this is the ideal scenario what people are striving for. So first should be an identification of a problem. And I'm calling this move from perception to data. Too often do I see people think about a plant just because it's there and other species have declined, that the plant is the problem. That not all, is not always the case. Um, there may be other things, invasive worms, deer, um, um, pollution, other things may actually uh, favor an introduced spe a species. So I like to move from perception to data so we actually do understand what that is. And so ideally, we would like to have an idea about the rate of the spread of the introduced species and its distribution, the impact on native plant and animal communities. We typically attempt traditional control measures and biocontrol comes to the problem typically very late when all else has failed. Um, there should be an, um, a cost benefit ratio assessment of biological control. Um, and a survey for natural enemies in the introduction area. And that is critically important because very often insects or uh, natural enemies follow their introduced plants. We know that particularly well from agriculture where species have been uh, distributed around the globe and the natural enemies typically follow. Um, it may take a, a little while longer, but often they are there. Um, we're eating apples from New Zealand because some of the apple pests that we have in New York haven't made it to New Zealand although they need to be really, really careful about that. So this can take many years, very often decades. Then we move into uh, state two. That's the initiation of a controlled program. So for some reason, everything else has failed. We can't deal with the plant. Um, um, we think it has uh, documented negative impacts. And then we move to the native range and very often that's being contracted out. There are specialist organization, CADBE Europe, for example, that's where I used to work before I came to the US, uh, looks at natural enemies in the native range, looks at the life history, their distribution, what the impact would be on a plant. And sometimes we have ideas about specificity because taxonomists, particularly in areas where entomologists, where the, uh, um, the fauna is a little more well known, they may have identified the organisms and said, this is the host plant and it's not being recorded for something else. And then we would develop a screening plant list. So these are basically the species that are being tested. I'll talk about that in a moment more so. This can be done pretty quickly, sometimes two to three years, depending on accessibility. So um, it's really difficult to go to places that are war zones. Ukraine may come to mind. 
Pakistan, other places, Himalayas comes to mind where you have conflicts, you can't go. And so sometimes that's the origin where a species was coming from. Uh, and so you are, you are limited in your capabilities um, by other things than biology and ecology. Uh, if you can go beyond that uh, uh, early stage, um, then detailed investigation follows. That's really life history. What's the impact on the plant? What's the host specificity in some detail? Um, that can take many, many years. Uh, we have been working for, well, I, this is 18 years, so this is like uh, four years old, the slide on Phragmites and, uh, uh, and, and so forth. Um, typically because insects then are in very short supply, they may be rare, People try to do mass rearing techniques, and then there is going to be a tag review. I will be talking about that too. That goes to the uh, to USDA APHIS, um, and a finding of no significant impact is needed to then proceed. Um, there are details that we may want to talk about how the Fish and Wildlife Service is involved um, if we get to that. Um, and then, um, so this is all pre-release, right? So no insect has left the quarantine facility or has been shipped. Again, the life history or impact of the host specificity can be done in the native range, or very often it's being done in quarantine, depends a little bit on where the organisms are from. Um, you would like to establish a monitoring program to really understand what's happening to plant animal dynamics, if you can capture that. Um, before insects are being released. Um, that was critically important for us when we did the garlic mustard work because we realized we don't need biocontrol to control garlic mustard. Negative soil feedback does that for us. So no biocontrol is needed, but it's also rarely done. It's a little increasing now, but the funding and the procedures need further development there. Ideally, we would use demography and I'm drilling down on that one a little bit to understand how the plan uh, life cycle is affected by different forces, whatever that may be. And then if you uh, uh, all go on through that, you can have shipment and release of control agents. Loose drive took, I guess, seven years to do that. Some organisms are quicker, particular if they have been used somewhere else, but it can take much, much longer. It's part of the regulatory requirement. And in the US, it takes much, much longer than in Canada, even though the proposals are the same. So if you have released these organisms, detailed investigation should follow, but rarely do. Um, there is mass production and redistribution. Um, lots of people want the organisms and they're still in uh, uh, pretty rare. Uh, monitoring and evaluation should follow both on the impact that the organisms have and their spread. And uh, what is both the ones that were the target plant plant and animal species and community. And once again, focus on demography, um, which is meaning how do the released insects affect the demography of the target plant or the demography of, um, uh, of, of native organisms. So that's meaning life and death of these organisms. Um, we know how, what the human population will be a few years from now based on all the information that we have about death and birth rates in different places. So that's what as uh, somebody doesn't know what demography means, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, this can take 10 to 20 years and I will show you information that that may be much longer. You already realize what I'm talking about is requiring a lot of money to be able to sustain this over extended periods of time. Um, and so we're talking uh, a couple of million dollars to actually run a program like that with uh, in, in today's dollars. Uh, and then in the end, um, there should be an evaluation of what actually happens. Was the ecological and, and, and that includes an ecological and economic assessment of the entire project. If you can get to an economic assessment for an environmental uh, the weed, for example, which is really, really difficult because the methods don't exist. That's why it's rarely conducted. We lack the procedures, we lack the funding. Um, yeah, and so typically what that amounts to is lack of accountability in agencies and funding bodies. Um, I'm not just talking about biological control. So uh, Cody talked about uh, herbicide manuals and, 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 and other things or whatever you throw at introduced plants. Do you really go in and uh, have a good assessment of what you did and how successful that was? And what are you actually counting as a success? 
So it's really done. Weed biocontrol is not uh, solely here uh, that we critique it for lack of accountability. I think it goes for almost all introduced plant management and a lot of conservation, actually, in fact, as well. So <clears throat> that's the state of the art as it should be uh, conducted. So weed biocontrol has been around for well over 100 years. So we have a track record. And uh, one wonderful thing about weed biocontrol programs, and I don't know how it came to be that it, it, it developed, while the, while the data record is not as, as wonderful and extensive as I would like, but every program is cataloged, has a catalog about it. Where, what was the target plan? Where did the insects come from? Where were the insects? Where were they released? And it's done by country. So we have an absolutely wonderful record. Um, and that's being updated. Um, and so worldwide, over 550 herbivores, these are largely insects, have been introduced uh, against 224 different plant species. So together, if you count that, it's over 2,000 programs that we have records of. The most active ones are in North America, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Uh, Europe just joined this. It's not very active, but there was not much other than uh, we go to Europe to find uh, biocontrol agents because a lot of the plants that were problems were coming from Europe. But Europe had its own, pro its own problems and it started a biologic control um, using Japanese knotweed. Um, similar, unsuccessful as in North America as of yet. So from everything that we know um, is, is that non-target effects, and this is from the 1998 catalog that I, that I pulled, and it has been updated. Feeding on other plants other than the target plants have been recorded on 24 plant species. So that's 6.8%. So that is very often spillover. What is spillover? Meaning you have millions of insects sometimes developing, defoliating the host plant. Hungry new individuals emerge after larval development and they try to taste all kinds of things that are looking green and it's not the target plant, so that's a spillover. Large population build, some insects uh, are, are trying to test things, particularly inexperienced young ones. Those of you who have had or have young kids will know what I talk about, that they try everything uh, until they realize, oh, this is not tasty, so they move, uh, move away. Established populations on species that were not targeted is four. Um, so that's four organisms. That's less than 2% of the organisms that were released worldwide. And then demographic effects, meaning that the affected populations of the non-target species are one or two, depending on how you count. So the target uh, species, the most well-known one is Rhinocillus conicus, the species that attacks lots of different thistles in different genera. It was known that it would attack a broad spectrum of organisms, including native thistles. It was introduced into New Zealand, uh, Australia, and also in North America. We knew it wasn't, or the people that did it, uh, it was not species specific, but at the time in the 50s and 60s where these programs were run, um, the basic theme was only a dead thistle is a good thistle. It didn't matter whether it was native or introduced. Um, and so now with societal values that have shifted, rhinocillus is considered a problem for conservation um, and uh, so we have demographic results for it that that's happening. Cactoblastis is a moth that was introduced from South America all around. The world is one of the most famous examples of biological control doing really well in Australia because it cleared up the range, but then it was introduced into some islands in the, uh, in the Caribbean um, and either through um, hurricanes, uh, not active flight, or most likely ornamental uh, transport, it came into Florida, and it's spreading from Florida around the, the Gulf Coast now, attacking some native thistles, uh, or punch of thistles, that is, um, yeah, cacti, not thistles. Um, and so there, there is a problem. It seems to be having some effects, uh, and they use sterile insect release technique to try to uh, prevent its spread further into potentially Mexico. For rhinocillus, the effects were anticipated at the time of introduction. Cactoblastis is not species specific. Didn't matter in, uh, in Australia because they wanted to get rid of, rid of all the cactoblastis species. So we have one or two species where we know 
that native plants are negatively affected at the population level. What the food webs are and how these new organisms are incorporated in the food webs, we do not know. The question is whether we can even detect it because if you think about insects coming in, building huge populations, controlling the plant in, in its wake, and then the populations plummet, is it just a pulse experiment Is it a, or a pulse signal that we have? Um, we cannot predict that. It has rarely been measured, but for sure there will be food web effects. Most of the time, people would think about incorporation of introduced plants into food web as something that's beneficial. Um, but um, we have few data on that. I'm going to go a little bit. Uh, so th that's an overview of all the programs. We can talk about details. Um, to test whether the insects that we're using are specific to the plant that we would like to target, uh, we use different testing procedures. Let's so go from small cages and petri dishes to larger cages in a greenhouse or in a field cage or an open field test we can, that we can only do uh, in the native range because obviously you need a, uh, uh, a release permit to do this in North America. As the realistic or the reality of these things increases, so the, um, the reliability of the results that you're getting are improved. If you think about an insect in a Petri dish on a cut leaf, that will, insect may try all kinds of different things and maybe even laying eggs on that one. Once you move to cut stems or whole potted plants or field grown plants and give a multiple choice like a test that you see here in the top right hand corner, the insects become more choosy, but even in a field cage, they're still being prevented from moving away from the plot that you are testing on. So, um, so there's problems with interpretation of the data that very rarely is being reflected when people are critiquing things or are being um, worried about uh, that insects would have uh, taken a nibble on some things in a no choice test in a petri dish. So what was being tested is both adult feeding, whether they're ovipositing, whether larval development is possible, whether pupation is possible, what the fecundant would be, or whether an insect can maintain in populations on, uh, on a native non-target species. All this information about the plant, about the insect, its life history, its potential impacts and everything else needs to be submitted to the technic technical advisory group for the biological control of weeds. So it's an established federal group with representation from Mexico and Canada because insects may not respect uh, political boundaries. So consultation with Canada and Mexico is involved in that one. I have listed here the members of the technical advisory group. It is an advisory group because it makes a recommendation when you say, these are the test plants that I would like to test for this particular plant species and this particular insect. It will also make a recommendation to USDA FIS whether a petition to field release an organism is supported by these uh, by these uh, uh, these agencies or their representatives or not, you will realize that all of the representation except from Canada and Mexico are federal ones. There is there is nothing else on there um, because only federal agent or federal agencies can advise the federal government. Um, that has created some debate and conflicts, but that's the way that the law is written right now. Here's a flow chart of what would go through that. I'm not gonna go into the details, but there is a, a relationship between the people that are developing biological control programs, the technical advisory group given advice, um, reviews and otherwise, and at some point the Fish and Wildlife Service can come in. USDA APHIS is the, um, the federal agency that makes an executive decision uh, and publishes in the federal register for, um, uh, for review by everybody then. And so this is how this entire biocontrol program can go through, um, uh, through, through the entire system. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, but it's all there. By the way, this doesn't exist for insect biocontrol because weed biocontrols or herbivorous insects were regulated as potential plant pests. That's why this group is there. It doesn't exist for uh, insect biocontrol. 
part of what uh, is expected from by the petitioners is to speculate or know something about environmental impacts that the release of these organisms would have. So basically it's a NEPA um, uh, a document that you need to create. Human impacts, economic impacts, plant impacts, non-plant impacts, you see it all. Methods on how you would mitigate if there are impacts and the outcome of no action. Ultimately though, this entire system is only evaluating the potential effects of an insect release, not what is being done right now and how detrimental herbicide use may be or what the ecological impacts are. So it's uh, USDA APHIS is only evaluating the outcome of a um, uh, herbivore release to control and introduce plant. Once again, uh, so the Fish and Wildlife Service is involved in all kinds of different things because they're worried about uh, endangered species. Um, we can talk about where we are in this, if that's desirable at the end of this presentation. I have additional material about that, but I uh, uh, will not do it. There is a review because if endangered species are part of uh, what could be a threat, you always need to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So, despite all this stuff, despite all the reviews, despite all the uh, uh, the data that we have, there's always concern about host specificity and whether the insects are able to do what we hope they do. Uh, what I can say about the host specificity and the science of host specificity, uh, it's very mature delivering predictable results. Despite occasional nibble, nibbling and some other plans, um, the insects that are having demographic negative impacts, rhinocillus and cactoblastis, that was known and predictable before. And no surprises there. Uh, the uh, decision to release no matter what or release close to the US, that those were political decisions. Um, and uh, we can't blame the insects or the science that evaluated how specific these organisms are for that. Uh, there's no evidence. Um, to suggest that rare species are at special risk. There's a wonderful paper about hound's tongue about that out there because the U.S. declined to release um, an insect that attacks the roots of hound's tongue because there are some rare species uh, in the Rockies. Um, and uh, now we have field data to show that the insects are not seeking out rare species. But I have to also agree that we have very little data because it's difficult to uh, to uh, to document the absence of anything that's happening, right? So how do you do that? So there are methodological problems um, and funding problems. Uh, what we are unable to do is project into the future. So well, how specific will these insects be in 10,000, 20,000 years or so? Uh, it may be even in a thousand. For now, there's uh, no evidence over decades that uh, the stable relationship between insects and their um, or uh, be between plants and their specific insects has has changed at all. Um, so if you think about it, this is an example, there's less probability that these insects will be shifting than that the monarch or other insects are shifting hosts. So is the, can I give you a guarantee that they never will? No, and I will not do it because uh, there's always the possibility. Evolution is everywhere. Evolution is much faster than we typically think. But right now, uh, the likelihood that our uh, insects that we purposefully release and tested will do something um, is much smaller than, uh, uh, than, as I said, for the monarch or the native insects. Nevertheless, there's a need for assessing all this. And uh, um, the inaugural issue of biological invasions had a paper in it that, that, that I authored and said before, during, and after, we need to understand before we release, when we release, after we release, or when we do plant management. It's not specific to biological control what we're doing here. But what should be of concern, right? So um, I've talked a lot about demography. Um, and so that's where I think we need to focus on. Insects, um, other uh, organisms will nibble all kinds of things and trying to figure out, oh, this smells like a banana, but it tastes, doesn't taste like a banana. If I wanna eat a banana, I'm not gonna eat this thing. It's the same for a lot of the specialists. Sometimes they need to figure out what it is that they want to want to um, uh, put an egg on or for a larva to develop because there are consequences if they make mistakes. 
Um, these are evolutionary consequences because their fitness will decline. So there are good reasons why these insects are specific because they pay performance penalties that can include death if they make mistakes. So we should use demography as our uh, yardstick here and occasional feeding, even the death of an individual can be tolerated if the populations of what the insects are feeding on uh, persist or grow. That's not being used right now in a decision-making process, by the way. And then the question is the definition of success. Once again, we have very few examples where people have followed through and showed it all. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence. You have seen all kinds of pictures. People talk about it. But as I said, um, I published a paper that's now over 20, yeah, it's 25 years ago, um, where I critiqued that this wasn't done. When I came to the U.S. and did the Purple Loose Stuff, when I remember a big meeting of wetland managers in Minnesota, um, must have been in the early 1990s, and I said, we need to do monitoring to understand what our insects are doing, only to be told by the experienced people in the room and the wetland managers that they know when a success has occurred by just looking at them. Most of them will have retired by now, I assume, um, and uh, I vehemently disagree with that. Uh, you have people that change jobs. Not everybody looks out on the same uh, wetland over time. And how do we know that it was the insects and not something else that changed how wetlands are being, uh, or wetland plant communities are structured? So, and there are two processes of success in the way that I define them. One is biological. And again, ideally defined through demography and population is suppression of a target plant's abundance and spread achieved. That's how most people will actually monitor um, success in their introduced plant management. But that's not enough. There has to be a definition of ecological success, once again defined through demography and populations. Do native species increase as you do in a management concern or a management here? Here it's release of biocontrol agent. Or if you mow or if you spray, very rarely do I see that. And then the absence of non-target effects. Is what you're doing here release of biocontrol agents affecting species that you didn't want to target? It's the same for herbicide or mowing or anything else that you do. And then there can be social and economic definitions of success as well. I want to note here that biocontrol agents can only influence biological success, right? They can only reduce the abundance of the plant that they are specialized on. If you made a mistake in thinking that the plant is the problem in the system that you work in, then you bring in insects and they reduce the abundance of the plant and no improvement is happening, the plant was probably not the reason why you saw the ecological deterioration. And I'll give you an example from the hamster mill of weed biocontrol out on rangelands. If overgrazing by livestock or elk or deer is the problem, you can take the one plant out with the specialized insects only to have other introduced plants pop up. So the plant, the thistle or the knapweed or whatever else you have was not the problem. Overgrazing was the problem. If you don't tackle that, you're not making any difference. So biological success does not automatically result in ecological success if you did the wrong diagnosis of what's uh, affecting the system negatively. And lack of funding prevents rigorous assessment. We've tried for a long time. We need to do what I'm going to show you in a moment on a shoestring budget. Uh, so that's not always there. So let's see where I'm with the time. OK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about loose strife um, because I've been involved in that since 1985. That was my PhD overseas in Europe. So here's a timeline. Went reasonably quick, as I said, seven years. <clears throat> released two leaf feeders and a root feeder, followed by a flower feeder, mass production, monitoring protocol, uh, and so on. And so 24 years later, uh, I'm going to show you where we are at. So um, what you have here, ignore the first line here. Um, I made a mistake. Let me go to the other one first. I need to advance. I did the wrong order of the slides. So what we did in New York paid by the New York Department of Environmental Conservation. We followed up on all the releases that we did in New York. And so here are the different regions. I think these are 37 sites where we went, released insects, established permanent monitoring quadrats, one meter quadrats, 
went in, recorded the insect diversity, I'm sorry, the insects, how their populations were building up, what's happening to the plant communities. We measured the stems, how tall they are, how many there are, typically twice a year. There's a cluster at Montezuma here because we also tried to understand whether leaf beetles alone or root feeders alone or in combination would be better than anything else. Um, we had a couple of years before the leaf beetles ran all over the place and ruined our wonderful experimental design. Um, and so I can't talk much about that uh, other than the early years. So what we saw overall, and you see the timeline here, and zero is the time that insects were released up to 25 or 28 years that we followed. Um, ignore the first one here. But what we have here, these are models. I'm not going to go into the models, but the results are what happens to overall plant species richness after insects were released. And you can see it took almost seven or eight years here before the richness increased at the places that we were monitoring. That's per meter square. Once we do diversity, Shannon diversity, or the total cover of uh, species that are not loose drive increased only after a decade. What the hell does that mean? Okay, so this was the thing. Well, what happened over time was that loose drive disappeared from individual quadrats. So our quadrats were established at the local, at the sites, and it had to have at least one loose drive in it to be able to put a quadrat in there. Typically, we did then transects across the site. And this is how stem numbers of loose drive declined over time. And you can kind of see what I showed you before, the increase in diversity, uh, Shannon diversity, cover of native plants, coincided with loose drive numbers of stem per quadrat really dramatically decreased. It took a lot of time to get to that point. But what we also understood by having done this now over time is that loose drive really is the driver in the system, at least for plant diversity. The higher the stem number is per meter square, right? The lower is the total cover of other plants other than loose drive. And you have to get really, really low. There's obviously a lot of noise in the system. But once you reduce loose drive to low numbers, total cover of native species increases. You don't need to get rid of loose drive. By all means, a few loose drive stems in the, in the quadrat, a few plants in the wetlands, even up to 10 or 20% of the community being made up of loose drive is no longer an ecological issue for native plants. All right, what happened to native species? That's the ultimate thing that we were going at. Initially, all species richness increased. <clears throat> it took almost 15 years to get to the point where native species were able to recover and then now dominate most of the locations that we worked at. Does that happen at every single location? No, but these are all the species combined. In some places we had weed canary grass or even uh, native or introduced typha cattails take over some places. But in general, this is the pattern that you see. It takes a long time because the native plant species that may not be in the seed bank need to recolonize those sites. If you were to do a herbicide treatment or a mowing treatment, those plant species have no time to go and reoccupy that. But a slow decline in loose drive gives the native plant species time to recolonize. We need that time. We need that patience. And most of the time, I do not see managers have the willingness or the patience to wait that long. That's very unfortunate. We're always in for quick successes. What happened to the species of concern? There were two in particular that some, there was some opposition to applying uh, biocontrol to loose drive. Higa and McCoy wrote a, wrote a piece in 1998, I believe. And uh, uh, I did the whole specificity test on loose drive in, uh, uh, in Europe. And there were two very closely related plans, Lithrum alatum, uh, <laughs> winged loose drive, and Decaton verosolatus. Um, is swamp willow or swamp, yeah. Um, they were nibbled on by the insects in some of those tests. So there was a concern. And so we asked managers uh, up and down the East Coast and so on, what, what, what are we doing? Uh, and for some, they said, please control decadon because 
It's a weed in Maryland and maybe in Pennsylvania, people treat it. You go to Maine, it's on the endangered species list for the state. So the, uh, oper uh, the opinions were all over the board. Uh, and ultimately we said, the risk by loose turf is greater than the potential risk that these species may be attacked by um, um, after a field release of these insects. So that was a concern. What happened? Lutherum uh did exist in the northern Montezuma wetlands. It was basically wiped out. Um, and now it has been rediscovered by David Veria, a rub it that, uh, well, the people in New York know who David Verrier is. He's just rewriting the, the flora of New York. So Luthrum Aladum reappeared at Montezuma, where the managers are no longer worried about Lustrife because it's under biological control. Decadum veritas uh, is thriving and occasionally dominant, making 20 to 30 percent of the uh, plant community cover in wetlands. You can stand on Decadum here. There's Lustrife here in the background, partly defoliated. Um, this is the white the green leaves are uh, Decadum. This one here is not flowers, it's a dot. It's a daughter that is actually parasitic on, on, on Decadon. So it's thriving uh, in New York, it's thriving in the Montezuma wetlands. So what happens is one of the major competitors was removed, meaning Lithrum salicaria, and the ones that were suppressed by Lithrum salicaria are now once again um, having places to live and thrive. So this is what loose drive looks like in 2019. Um, so play, all of these places were almost uh, monoculture of those loose stripes. This is a place called Eagle Point at the Montezuma wetlands. Now there's loose strife there, there's golden ruds there, there's eupatorium there, lots of other plants, a lot of other sedges. You may have quarters that don't hold any loose strife anymore, but a nicely flowering New England aster. This is the Montezuma wetlands as you would be driving, that's the wildlife refuge as you would be driving on the throughway, what was all loose drive at some point, now is all cattail. Don't know whether that's really an ecological success, plus some hibiscus in the front. You cannot find a loose drive unless you look really, really careful. Now, loose drive by all means is not gone from the landscape. No way. People see it all the time, but it's along roadsides. It's where maintenance occurs, where spraying occurs, where salt may be occurring, where the insects are mowed down because the Department of Transportation, of course, cares about uh, right of way and safety or other things. I have no problem with that. These are stepping stones for the insects as they disperse, disperse from one place to the other. So we see plenty of drive and I get plenty of calls in August and September. What, what's happening with loose drift? Enjoy it. It's a roadside attraction right now. That's the status of loose drift in, in New York. Um, and uh, obviously we didn't go to all the other states, but we have reports not as extensive and detailed as we have it from other states as well. So here's the card or summary of what has happened in a biological control project here for loose drive. And it we are at 25 years. I was lucky that I did my PhD on it and I could follow it to this point. Is loose drive done? Are all the succession done? No, it will continue to be suppressed. Uh, you need to leave the individual plants or low populations in place so they function as um, gas stations if the insects want to refuel, so to speak, right? But you have, over time, uh, after the insects establishing a decline in the competitiveness of loose drive, an increase in the native plant diversity, and an increase in um, uh, overall plant diversity and native plant diversity. So you get to these uh, beautiful wetlands with an abundance of flowerings for pollinators and everything else. If you have the patience, if you do not interfere, it takes a very, very long time, but it can be extremely successful. Um, except out West, nobody does anything to loose drive here anymore. Uh, people are more worried about introduced phragmites or something else. This is what I have to tell you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer all kinds of questions if you have. Yes, thank you very much, Bernd. And we have the Q&A is open or the chat if folks want to add questions into there. We have a few minutes uh, that we can use for questions before we wrap up here. And I see we have one that just came in in the chat. What insect biocontrol was used? 
uh, is the question. I'm not sure if you need so more I'm not context. Sure than that. That, I, that I fully understand it where I didn't show the insects, right? So it's one of the few examples where I'm giving a talk and didn't show the insects. I apologize for that. Uh, but these are two leaf beetles, uh, very closely related to the water lily leaf beetle in the same genus, Gallerocella calmariensis and Fusilla. A root feeder that a uh, uh, halobius transverse obitatis, a mouthful, uh, and a flower weevil called Nanotheus marmoratus. So what the, this, the, the thinking was when we did this, we wanted to attack almost all niches on the plant, the roots that are the perinating way for loose drive to uh, uh, overcome seasons and stuff. That's what the root feeder at attacks. The leaf beetles were the defoliators, and then uh, the, the flower feeder would reduce further reduce seed output. We know that the leaf beetles are the big hitters. That's also immediately obvious because you see the defoliations. This was one of the slides that I showed, even though there were no larvae visible, it was just the defoliated plants. Most people would give the, uh, <clears throat> the leaf beetles credit for it, <clears throat> but we know that there are, that these insects now occur at almost every site in New York, if you look carefully, including the root feeder. Uh, and they are doing better when they're in combination, although I wouldn't bet my entire annual salary on that one if somebody would carefully check. But that's what it seems to be like. They're just not visible. They're night active. The larvae live in their roots, so you can't really see what's happening. Great, thanks for that. And I know um, we do need to share the poll so that folks can get credits. We may do that poll while we're still answering questions. So if you see that appear on your screen, please complete that. Uh, Rob will be launching it now. We just had another question. Do you think Hypena opulenta, sorry if I slaughtered that, <laughs> will be successful on black swallow work control? Uh, so it's Hypena opulenta, that's we, how we typically pronounce it, Carrie. And my answer is no. Um, and I think I, uh, I just wrote a report about that. And um, uh, I think the Canadians who have released earlier than, uh, than in the US, I think they, uh, they probably share this. Uh, Hypena is a shade species. Um, and uh, so the insects don't like to get out of the shade. Uh, swallowwort is not really a shade species, kind of peters out there. Um, and uh, while they have establishment, there is no suppression of, uh, of swallowwort. Um, so it's not the best organism, it was the one that was available. It's the same for the psyllid on Japanese knotweed. It's highly specific, but doesn't do diddly squad to knotweed. Um, so it's not very useful if you're trying something different. And swallowwort, by the way, uh, look for callings at all last year uh, in, I think it's an ecosphere, show that swallowwort goes away if you don't manage it over time. Uh, but you need to exclude deer. So deer are the driving factor for swallowwort. Um, that's what we see for microstegium as well. So um, controlling the plant is taking the symptom out, but not the uh, overarching disease. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. I I appreciated your comments of biological success does not always mean ecological success. And I think that's an important take home from this. So yeah. I see we have two questions left in the chat. Uh, we have two minutes left, so we'll try to get through those and then I will pass it to Cody uh, to wrap us up. So the, the next question was, generally speaking, biocontrols face rigorous research prior to TAG approval and release, right? <laughs> Correct. Anything you want to expand yeah. on that? <laughs> no, it takes it takes well over a million dollars. It takes uh, you know, lots of scientific expertise domestic and overseas, and then a review by by experts in, in the field. So um, yeah, um, that's all that I can say. So you have time, 20 <laughs> seconds for the last all right. question. <laughs> uh, the, I see a bunch have come in. I'm going to try to capture those to see if we can get those answered after the fact. But the last one that I saw was, are you having su success with controlling water chestnuts? So we are not at the stage where we're releasing it. Um, we're just writing this petition that needs to go to the technical advisory group. We have a very potent organism from China that we have in quarantine. Um, and so if we get the release permit, we think it will be a winner, similar to the ones that are on, 
Now on loosestrife, it's also in the same gene as another leaf beetle, similar to the water lily leaf beetle, um, Galerocella bermanica. And so hopefully, and I know Rob is waiting for that uh, uh, as well. Um, hopefully we'll have some luck in the next couple of years. So we're, we're working on it. We're very close for the petition, but I'm not making the decision. I'm only the science support person. The USDA APHIS will make the decision. All right, so great. Thanks talk. everyone for your questions and I'll pass it to Cody to wrap us up. Awesome. I was going to say we could probably take a couple more questions, but I'll go ahead and wrap us up and get us out the door uh, a little early today. Thank you so I'm, much. I'm for okay if there are people that want to hang in. So that just depends totally on you, right? So I don't need to run out the door uh, for another at least 15 minutes. Okay. Um, well, how about I, we have one one question here about um, hound's tongue root, the hound's tongue root weevil, which made its way. And if you don't mind answering this one, yep. um, so you mentioned hound tongue, hound's tongue root weevil. That's a name, uh, which made it to Montana, where I am from Canada, where it was approved. And landowners very much are cautious if it if if this is a potential to be approved at some point in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> you needed to open up a question that allows me to talk for half an hour, huh? <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, so the, the story is correct. The U.S., because of the potential of attack by Nigriscutis, I think is the, uh, the genus name of a little root weevil that attacks hound's tongue, did not give approval for release. The Canadians said, go ahead. We are happy with what you have shown in terms of the specificity and the selectivity that this organism has. So they released the insects. And um, the paper that I referred to is a demographic analysis uh, done in Canada um, who, uh, that, that showed if you have hounds stung together, I don't know which rare species th th there was, but it's in the Boraginaceae. I forgot uh, which one it is. Um, and so if you look at the decision making by this weevil, where the eggs are being laid, it's all on hound's tongue. So the experience from the Canadians is the release is justified. The weevil is specific in the field. It's not going to attack the rare species. So that it made its way into Canada, I'm sorry, into Montana. Um, I don't know. Some people are worried. Some people are hopeful that there are, that then all of a sudden there will be a, an approval for release. Typically, what happens at the regulatory uh, system is that if you have an insect in the state, you can do with it whatever you want. That's my understanding. I don't know whether the people in Montana are willing to do that, that are wanting to propagate the insects or not. We are waiting for the insects that were released on Phragmites in Canada to make its way across the Great Lake so that we can then further distribute them because... The Canadians, once again, made a different decision in USDA APHIS that they consider these organisms safe. So there, there's lots of politics involved in this one. Hound's tongue is also not just an ecological problem, but one for the, for the uh, uh, ranching industry because it doesn't beautify the cattle's heads at uh, the fruit stick to their head. So it looks kind of nasty that way. I'm sorry, that's, it's a long convoluted answer and I can go on for an hour, about a half an hour. No problem. We love the discussion. It's great. Um, so there was one last question, but I, I don't know. Um, it was, how could TNC be helpful in creating an army of researchers on biocontrol? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is easy. Money, right? <laughs> so that's always what it comes down to. But it's not just that. Mm -hmm. What I just explained to you, and I don't know why it is specifically in the U.S., that the regulatory uh, environment at the present time is one of over caution. We would not get our loosestrife insects into the system right now, for example, just because of the attack on Luthermalatum in host specificity test or on Decadon. They would be completely excluded. Uh, the Canadians are, I don't think they are more risk averse because they say in our introduced plans that are really serious here that we need to do something different than spraying. Um, because that's also not successful. So they release biocontrol and they're having, having some success. I don't know why it's specific to the US. Maybe the everything hinges on the willow flycatcher 
example, and uh, some folks in the Fish and Wildlife Service. I do not know that. So the concern is, and it was magnified by the willow flycatcher example in the Southwest, endangered species. They released insects to control salt cedar. That also gets pretty rapid defoliation and a lot of, not a lot, some birders were thinking that that would negatively affect the uh, uh, endangered southwestern willow flycatcher. So if you go float down the Grand Canyon, you will see beautiful biocontrol of salt cedar in its place. And slowly riparian vegetation is re re replacing salt cedar. But that was, I mean, it went all the way through the courts. Um, people were all up in arms about it. The temporary reduction in cover and nesting for the uh, southwestern willow flycatcher was considered so ecological dangerous that there would be uh, that there shouldn't be any biocontrol. The outcome right now, if you look at it, is completely in the way that it is with loose drive. Riparian vegetation is replacing salt cedar. And the, the, it's not like wildfire that the diorapta, that's the Latin name of this leaf beetle that I go on through that. So there will be an ecological success, not just a biological success, but it takes time and a slow reduction in the uh, local slow reduction in the willow flycatcher population means long-term improvement for their ability to thrive in the Southwest. Again, a long answer. I don't know. Funding, uh, support for biological research, that's what is needed because in the Northeast, if I retire in a few years, there will be almost, there will be nobody who is running the biocontrol programs here in the Northeast. Everybody has retired and there's no new blood coming in. Uh, out West, it's a little different and in Canada, it's different. That's very, it's very unfortunate because that's one of the few methods that I think is successful in doing introduced plant control. Um. Rob, you have your hand up. Yeah, just real quickly. Uh, thanks for the discussion, Baron. And I just wanted to uh, revisit the um, the Invasive Species Research Institute has made available in the past a small wirebound booklet on biocontrols that either have been approved or, or may or may not be available. Is that resource still available, and is it still available through the? The, uh, through Nazri, it, it should all be there, um, Rob. And it, these should be all. These are online resources, right? Uh, I know that I, I believe you can get it through the website, but I also know uh, Carrie used to give out copies. At, at yeah, so a, a lot of these resources were coming from the Forest Service, um, and Dick Reardon um, uh, used to used to do that. Um, and he was shipping boxes full of these guides around. So we had some of them. We still have some of them, but they're also all online. Um, and so there's a new guide, Rachel Winston, who did the, and the, there should be a new guide for all kinds of biocontrol out there. Rob, send me an, I will, I will back to you. There's a big biocontrol summit next week that uh, uh, Wade uh, Simmons, who does the Water Chestnut work, and I will go to in Annapolis, Maryland. I will make sure that uh, I ask about that. But all of these resources should be available online. Um, so I know I've done these things on, on, on Loose Drive and on Phragmites. Uh, Water Chestnut is not part of that because new insects have been released as of yet. So the research part is not it, but everything that has been implemented and released should be available for everybody to take a good look at. Um, if you send me an email, I will send the resource to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we're getting done a little early. If there's any last final questions or thoughts that you have before I let everybody yeah, go. I, I just wanted to uh, tell people if they have specific questions, um, my email probably has been shared or something like that. If not, it's bb22 at cornell.edu, but you can also find me by Googling. Um, so that's not a, uh, a secret, secret place. I'm happy to ad address some of those questions uh, if they get to me before March 18th, because then I'm going to go to Botswana to look at some other rewilding projects in the Okavango Delta. Well, that sounds pretty darn fun. So Delightful, thank you. doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. I'm sure everybody else here appreciates your time as well. Um, and 
on in a rare occasion, I will let you all go uh, a little early. So if there are any questions, please email Dr. Blossy. And if you can't find him online, you can email me. I did share my email and I can get those to him. So thanks everyone.